Hello, everybody, and welcome to my podcast. Everyone Deserves a Chance has a great guest today, and I'm going to read this by Rasul Mutawakios, and I'm just going to read from LinkedIn. I'm picking up his bio, and then I'm going to create justice here, and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself. He's a multifamily syndicator, investor, and e-commerce entrepreneur. You can follow him at Rasul C-R-E. He teaches investors how to generate high passive returns with low risk, highly diversified multifamily properties. His specialty is in underwriting 100 plus unit multifamily apartment complexes to determine their probability of success for his investors. Feel free to message him or reach out to him. Azul, thank you so much for accepting uh, this invite. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Sylvia. It's my pleasure. Thank you for being here. All right, I'm going to create justice now, and I would like you to introduce yourself because I can't just uh, reading out of a bio, just uh, tell everything that's going on with you. So please. Yeah, of course. No, yeah, I got into apartment building investing probably about three years ago now. I uh, started off in the residential side and house hacking a duplex. But before I even got into real estate, I was just a regular average Joe guy making his way through life following all the cues that we were taught growing up, right? So how do you become successful in America? You're supposed to go to school, get good grades, go get that job, and then find a wife, get a house, yada, 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 and then you become successful. So I did all that, but there was a little hiccup after I graduated high school. 9-11 had happened, and I, I felt a certain call to duty, so I served my country. I did five years in the U.S. Army as a Korean linguist, as a military intelligence operative. And man, let me tell you, that sucked. <laughs> um, joining the military during wartime, not the best idea. I heard it only went like downhill after I left. I, I did my five years. I did my part. I got out and basically just bummed around Miami for a couple of years after I got out. I was just bitter off the military and I had no sense of like financial literacy or anything like that. I actually managed to save up $40,000 on an $18,000 a year salary after five years of military service. I just didn't do anything and just stayed inside all day playing World of Warcraft. But when I finally got out, since I didn't have any guidance or knowledge of what to do with money, I had partied and spent all and every single dime that I had for two years straight. And then when I went broke, I thought, I guess let me go follow the plan that was prescribed to me about going to school, getting a degree and all that stuff. So I went a hundred grand in debt, getting a college degree, to learn how to program video games. Now, that sounds cool and sounds fun, but the problem with that was when I graduated, it was 2010, right after the Great Recession, and all these companies were laying everybody off, so I couldn't even get a job as a programmer back then. And I ended up getting a sales job, learning how to sell life insurance. And along the way, I met a guy who was actually a contractor who was also a real estate agent. And I was like, hey, I was interested in real estate. I, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad once, and I thought about it. I just didn't know how to get started. So he's like, go get your license. I was like, okay, cool. So I studied for a couple of weeks, took a course, got my license. I sat in one open house. I was like, no, that's not it, man. This is not what I envisioned for real estate investing. I learned very early on that, that wasn't the case. So after my sales stint, the market had gotten a little bit better. And a friend of mine from college said, hey, I can get you a tech job out here in the Midwest. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm dying here in this life insurance sales, this real estate thing's not working out. Let me go ahead and, and get this corporate job. So I took my then girlfriend, married her. We were engaged at the time. We got married, drove across the country. We left Orlando's where I was living at the time. I went to Full Sail. She went to UCF. And we planted roots in Kansas City. And I love Kansas City. For anybody who's listening, who's from there, or you've never been there, you don't think anything about it. But it's probably the nicest place I've ever been in the whole entire world. The people there are absolutely phenomenal. They're amazing. The only problem there is winters. <laughs> They have the most brutal winters and they last disproportionately long compared to the other seasons. So after four winters of leaving there, I ended up coming back to Miami. But when I was in uh, Kansas City, I got a tech job working for a company called Cerner. I was doing tier three support, help desk stuff, whatever. And I, I was just losing my mind because I had just come from being an entrepreneur for three years working for myself. And here I am slaving away nine to five on this grind. I had overtime. I had weekends. I was on call. I was like, there's no end to it. And I was on for a $50,000 a year salary. I was just like, this ain't it either. Luckily for me, I got fired from that job after about a year. And my wife said, you should try to apply for the government. 
And I was like, you know what? That's not a bad idea. I'm a veteran. I've got good grades, got a lot of skills. Let me see what I can go find. It so happens that in 2014, the Department of Housing and Urban Development was hiring in their multifamily division. And so that's when I first got introduced to uh, the commercial side of multifamily. But I was only as an employee working in that space. And I learned just the ins and outs of how HUD worked. And I remember one time I was processing this one assignment. It's called an EARL, Interest Rate Reduction Loan, basically a cash out refi. And I looked at the, the form and I was like, the moment I sign this and send it off, somebody out there somewhere in the world is going to make half a million dollars. And literally just, here you go, plus a lower interest rate. That's what they were going. They're going from 8% down to 4% and, and they're getting $500,000 back to them. And I'm just like, what is this? 10 years of my income on one sheet of paper. And so I planted that seed in the back of my mind. I was like, there's somebody out there who's just balling out of control. I got to figure this out. But for now, I'm on my nine to five grind. Let me climb the ladder and do all this other stuff. So I dedicated myself to climbing in, in the government. I got all the way up to a GS-13. I was a senior financial analyst. And when I got that job, my boss had said, welcome to the team. We're glad to have you. You're going to make a very good living here, but you'll never be rich. And then when he said that to me, I'm like, bro, we got a conflict of interest here because I know that I'm born to be rich. <laughs> okay? So I, I said this internally. I just got the job. I didn't want to mess it up on the first day. <laughs> so from there, I just I always had in my mind, that OK, I can't stay here forever because I see it all the time where people live. They're in this government job, super cushy. You're making six figures and they're very comfortable, but they go work for 30, 40 years. They retire and they die six months later. I was like, that's not going to be me. I can't do that. It's not my life. There's so much more to this world other than just grinding out this paperwork here. So my wife and I learned about real estate and we Googled, right? How do you get rich? Like literally that's, that was my exit plan. Like, how do you get rich? Dude, I love article. you more and more. <laughs> I, I found an article. It said 95% of millionaires are made in real estate. I was like, awesome. I've, I've done a little bit of real estate. That's cool. So I Googled, how do you do real estate? Found a forum called Bigger Pockets. Brandon Turner, watching a lot of his podcasts. Oh, I learned about house yeah. hacking. And, and so when we left Kansas City and got transferred to Miami, that's where we bought a duplex instead of a house. Because in, in Kansas City, we had a house. We didn't know. Just, yeah. So we learned about house hacking. I, I bought that duplex in Alapata and I was terrified. I'm, I'm one of those guys, and if anybody's listening, you can relate to this, who's like overly analytical. And I was telling my wife every reason why we shouldn't do this. I had this analysis paralysis is called, right? <laughs> yeah, analysis paralysis. And, and she was like, babe, she put her hand on my shoulder. She's like, just trust me. This is going to work. I was like, ah, okay. So it turns out I was right. Everything that could go wrong with that property it actually did wrong. go wrong. We had the four-point inspection, but the electricity had problems. The plumbing had problems. The roof had problems. The AC had problems. Everything went wrong in that property. But... She was also right because it was a fantastic learning experience about how real estate worked, how when things go bad, how you have to be able to find solutions and all sort of stuff. House hacking, if you guys uh, are not familiar, is basically you buy a small multifamily property, two, three, or four units. It's residential. You live in one side, you rent the other sides out. So my mortgage on the duplex was $2,100 a month. My renter was paying $1,900 because they were living in the 3-2 side. We lived in the 2-1 side. It was just me, her, and the three dogs. And my cost of living in Miami was $200 a month. Super cheap. I was like, oh, this real estate stuff really works. That's awesome, yeah. And, and then eventually we got into Airbnb. And then that $1,900 turned to $3,500. And I was like, babe, hear me out. What if we moved out back with my mom and dad in the house that I grew up in? <laughs> and we did Airbnb on both sides. And she was like, I'm down. My wife, Ashley, if you're listening, I love you. This is, it, was, it was an amazing move. So we did that. And man, Sylvia, that property was bringing in like $70,000 a year. It was insane just because it was the location close to the airport, close to Brickell, very centralized to everywhere, everything you want to do there. And I was flying high and mighty and all this other stuff up until I got to 2020 when COVID happened and all the travel stopped and all the booking stopped and all the cash flow stopped. I call that the double-edged sword moment for me because on the one hand, I did lose all the cash flow from that property. But on the other hand, I got all my time back. Because I didn't realize, because property management, I don't know if it's changed nowadays, but back then, property management just sucked for short-term rentals. There was nobody who was like reliable that, that could really take care of the property the way that I did. Because I was paying 20 25% of my earnings for these people. And then when things would break, I would still have to go. They would just tell me that it broke. I'm like, the guests are telling me, like, you're supposed to fix this. 
So it was just a nightmare of management. I was there probably three or four times a week. And so when the travel stopped and I realized, you know what, I really value my time over money because I'm making decent cash at my job. I don't want a part-time job making $70,000 a year. I want to be free. I want to be financially free and time free. So I took that, that, that opportunity during COVID. I was like, I need to figure out how to pivot in real estate. That's when I learned about syndications and buying apartment buildings and how you don't have to be like a super wealthy person to get involved in this. It's not just for hedge funds and Wall Street banks and all this other stuff. Like everyday guys like you and me and people who are listening have the opportunity to get involved if you have the knowledge necessary to be able to do a deal, right? I love, but, it, I love your story. So you and I yeah. both did the same exact thing. I was a W2 guy. I worked nine to five. I worked in construction. So I was a surveyor in New York City and trying to get out of nine to five in 2016. I started with bigger pockets, just like you. Yeah. Brandon Turner is my friend. We still, we're still connected today. We still speak with via Facebook and stuff. He's an extremely busy man now. He's in the syndication model as well for many years now. Yeah. Uh, Jay Scott, everybody into that, that space, the, the beginners from the bigger pockets, Ben Labovich. I was able to connect with all these guys back then, and they stirred me towards uh, investing in single family homes as well. So I started with um, a rent to rent model. I did that in Manhattan for the first time. I got myself a partner from Miami, a girl that I knew. She was an entrepreneur for over 10 years at the time. So I knew about her and I'm like, listen, I don't know anything about this business, but I won't do it by myself. With a mentor, I'm willing to put in the money and the time. And she says, listen, we'll do 50-50 on an apartment in Manhattan. You're going to do the managing and you're going to put half of the money in it. Yeah. So we did that. It worked out awesome. First year was amazing. The apartment was $3,000 a month. We're paying $3,000. We're pulling in $10,000 out every month. Wow. Yeah, it was nuts. And then they changed the laws. They made it illegal. We finished uh, the lease and that was it. The landlord didn't, didn't want to renew the lease for us. We are out of that apartment. But I've decided to take a leap of faith and I got my first apartment by myself. I got a commercial lease in Jersey City on a studio, a small studio. And I had a good friend, Otis. Uh, he's a commercial real estate guy. He's a commercial broker for years. And he helped me out find this apartment. I did it. I had a two-year lease. So now I've learned this Airbnb model and I'm excited. I'm pulling my W-2 job. My wife has a job. We're saving a lot of money. Plus we have these uh, passive streams of income. What I did in 2019, I added another one. I did two row. I purchased two cars. I was in Manhattan. It was illegal to do in Manhattan. I registered my cars on New Jersey because I have the rental in New Jersey. I got myself a license on that rental. And then I bought two cars in Jersey and I was delivering at New York airports. I did the same thing as you, except the COVID hit. My Turo rental business completely died on the spot. <laughs> I couldn't float it for a month. So I took the two cars. Meanwhile, I started flipping properties in the Poconos, which were about an hour and a half away from Manhattan. So between Jersey and Pennsylvania, I bought a property. I fixed flip. I rented it as an Airbnb. But this one was already a purchase, right? And mm -hmm. then I got another one that I was fixing and flipping. COVID hit and I ended up moving into that property. So I occupied one of the rentals, which was on a DSCR loan. And it was supposed to be a business flip, but I had nowhere to go. I had to run to Manhattan. Manhattan was getting shut down. So cash flow totally died for a few months. I saved my Airbnbs because we got some three months. People came in from Manhattan and they stayed three months. So one guy extended for four months. I lost the lease in Jersey completely. Mm. So the master lease that I have for two years ended up being only one year. Just made about $10,000 profit on that. My two cars made $9,000 because people are asking me a lot how much money is Toro making. I made with two cars $9,000 a year, which is not bad, but you got to scale it. You want to make a lot of money, you got to scale it. Yeah. Or you got to be in a better location though, like Miami, where you can yeah. do it year round, right? And you can do it with Lambos for a thousand bucks a day. Yeah, if you do Lambos, absolutely. Or you go Vegas. Alex Lovely from Legends Equity Group. And here it is, Legends yeah. Equity Group, right? Is the syndication that I'm part of. I was going to ask you and you didn't tell us. What's the name of the syndication that you're part of? I'm director of acquisitions for a company called Disrupt Equity. And it's funny that you mentioned Brandon Turner into syndications because when he started his fund company, Open Door Capital, he traditionally only did mobile home parks. And his first multifamily syndication was with Disrupt Equity. Oh, I didn't right? know that. It, it was right before I came on. They did it in July of 2021. 
So I took the time to, to pay for a mentor. I learned multifamily in 2020 of August. And I did my first general partnership in April of 2021. And then I did a 48 unit in May. And then I did an 18 unit. And then I did my 121 unit hotel. But in October, I became director of acquisitions for Disrupt Equity because I met the owners at a networking trip in Costa Rica. And they really liked my vibe. They had an event in Miami. I showed up, showed support, bought a ticket. And they were, we were just chatting. They're like, man, if you ever find yourself in Houston, man, we'd love to show you around. I was like, I'll be in Houston next week because I, yes, I got action. the invitation. Exactly, yeah. man. The universe rewards action, man. Yes. Absolutely. So you got to move fast when the door is open. Action takers are money makers. So I bought a ticket, brought my wife. She was pregnant with, with my daughter and my son. We all went over there. And she hit it off with Ferris's wife. They took the kids to the Children's Museum. We're hanging out. Me and Ferris and Ben went to a coffee shop after we were looking at some properties and stuff. And they said, you know what? We want to grow this company. We want to bring on some awesome talent. We really like your vibe, your energy, your hustle. And I was like, I'd be honored. So they, they brought me on as director of acquisitions. And my very first syndication with them was with Brandon Turner, the guy who taught me apartment investing. And it's funny because even after all of these years, the schedules just never lined up. I've never met Brandon. I've met Brian Murray. I met Ryan, I met Ryan Murdoch. I met all the C level employees, Walker. Oh gosh, I'm going to forget all of their names right now, but everybody in Open Door Capital, a uh, bunch of cool guys, super young. It's crazy. It's like the this ginormous fun company being uh, managed by 20 year olds, which I love it. It's uh, absolutely amazing. And so, yeah, I did my very first syndication with Disrupt with Brandon Turner. And so that's what we do. We basically find, manage the deals. Since I do acquisitions, I'm very good at running the numbers establishing broker relationships and i also do investor relations as well because i just i really talk to people multiple, yeah you get multiple position into a syndication when that yeah that come around yeah that's awesome man so yes to me personally just because you mentioned brandon turner i'm not even just saying that you work with him directly and he trusted the the name of your company it's just a sign up reason just because i know the track record that these guys had pretty much i've studied all the deals that that brandon purchased over the years Mm -hmm. I met him personally. I was lucky to meet him. He came in Jersey a couple of times to some small meetups that I was part of. Nice. And uh, yeah, I got a chance to meet him. I met his his lovely wife and he is part of a group called Go Abundance. Yeah. And I am not a Go Bro. I always applied for it and I keep failing because they keep moving the thing. It was a million dollars at first and they moved it to two millions. Now the elite is up to 10 millions. So your net worth or? Yeah, your net worth. Yeah. Not, not your investments, you're the actual net worth. So okay. that was the number I keep following, I keep falling short. And when I finally got it and I wanted to, I just didn't do it the, that specific year. And then I never got a chance to. And then again, my network went down because I ended up selling my portfolio. I bought four properties. I was doing Airbnb and it didn't go well for the past year and a half. Airbnb is not profitable anymore. Too many people entered the market with uh, limited knowledge. They completely alter the business model they were running. Yeah, and they forced me out of it. And this is the reason why I ended up looking for commercial real estate. I wanted a place to shelter my money. I wanted a place to park my money. And it's not, I'm not talking about millions. I'm talking about a couple hundred thousands that I got uh, after I sold these properties from equity. But I didn't want to pay the capital gains on the money. Yeah. The thing is that I didn't move fast enough and I ended up paying the capital gains for all the money. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started in December of last year, the syndication model through Grand Cardone. Yeah. which is a guy that I've never liked for a very long time. And all of a sudden, he resonated with me. I'm like, oh my God, this guy is talking to me. <laughs> past six, seven years, I'm not paying attention. Yeah, love him or hate him. If nothing else, he's an extremely skilled uh, businessman and marketer, brander. He's making it. Oh, he, he motivated me to the point where I was able to move the needle on the other side, spend $1,000 on one of his classes online, and then show up to the first event. And then from there on, it's all history. Because yeah. I met Alex, I met a lot, a whole bunch of people that I attached myself to. So it took me just six months, just like you said. I, I started Grand Cardone on December 18th. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of January, I was already joining Legends Equity Group. Nice. But I did about six weeks of major uncovering, pretty much, behind Legends Equity Group. So I went behind Alex and I looked at all the deals that he'd done and his partners and everybody else, just to make sure that the, choosing the syndicator was the right thing for me. And it yeah. wasn't for the investment, the money that I paid for the mentorship. It was for the deals that I want to get myself associated with. I knew my value. I knew what I can bring to the table, 20 plus years of experience in real estate and construction knowledge. 
So I'm like, okay, I got to find the right syndicator that, that resonates with me. And luckily, after a month and a half, Alex stood out of the crowd completely right. because he allowed me to see the deals from inside out. So I was going to Cardone's events, bro, and he was keep talking about these deals and I couldn't see the structure. I couldn't connect the dots. I was still an outsider, even though I was paying the fee to be inside. They were yeah. presenting deals, talking about deals, but there was no opportunity except limited partner. So I'm like, but that's not what I want. I want to learn the model. I'm not here just to give you my money and walk away. So that was, that was the turning point was Alex and the way he actually earned my business and got me into the syndication was because I was going to say he's doing Miracle Morning. Not, that's a hell of a doing Miracle Morning. He's yeah. doing Course in Miracles, right? Mm -hmm. He's presenting a, a very powerful class and he's doing it at least twice a week. I think he was doing Wednesdays and Sundays. And he talks about money and the mixture with God and how, to, how is it apply and applicable in, in commercial space. So that was a conflict that I had in me for a very long time. And I'm just, you can't mix money with God. That was me. I'm like, you, you just can't mix it. And then here I go, Cardone is mixing it. Then I hear Alex mixing it. And then I'm like, you know what? It actually makes sense. It was yeah. just my trust and my lack of education in the space. I couldn't trust anybody with my money because I wasn't educated enough to understand the whole business model. Of course, all my fears were coming in front of me. And I was like, just like you did. I was putting yeah. all the bad stuff first. Now nah, I'll give this guy the money. He's going to sell me a class. And then I won't get to talk to him for the next six months. Because this is what happened with all the other gurus that I was paying lots of money to. Along the lines, I associated myself with somebody that I resonated with. And uh, I didn't know about you guys at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that Brandon, because I lost track for a few years. When I dove into doing uh, single family homes, rehabs and Airbnb and all that stuff, it took me two years to flip four houses and to Ooh. do them all by myself. Yeah, I, I learned the model. I did all the work. I did everything for it. But for two years, I had my head down in the sand. I wasn't looking left and right. So that's when I lost. I didn't even know about Disrupt. I didn't know what Brandon was doing. I never called, asked, text, anything, anybody. I just yeah. came up. I'm like, okay, now what do I do? A new economy emerged. New things happen. So uh, that's how I ended up looking to multifamily and I became a general partner into my first deal. Not too long ago, we're still doing the paperwork to close on Ogden deal, the deal that we have the 30 units, which is my first. And a lot of legends are there. It's is their first deal. And we're very happy and excited that after almost three months uh, of raising for a small deal, we finally got to close. It, it's a very difficult time. It, at least it was for us to fundraise in a moment when interest rates are, re are rising every month. Yeah. It was ridiculously hard. Everybody put a stop on their money. I'm an investor for 20 years, but I'm not doing it now. Like mm -hmm. Cardone, he comes in on stage and he says, I'm not buying anything right now. I'm waiting for blood on the streets. I'm like, bro, you're waiting for three years. <laughs> like, you're not a syndicate anymore. You keep waiting. <laughs> Which is, it's interesting, right? Because I think he's pivoting into buying businesses now. And it lets me know where he's really at, right? Because he's got all this fame and cloud and attention which in today's market, you really need that to thrive as a business. But to be able to do the actual work of multifamily syndications, like if you're a true real estate investor, you buy in any market, right? Up, down, as long as you're able to make the deal work, you have to have the knowledge and experience. And that's what I really love about being a part of Disrupt is these guys are being able to make deals happen. If the blood is already in the streets and everybody knows that the opportunities are out there. But if you have an established reputation, like with Disrupt, we're already in Inc. 5000. They're the fastest growing real estate company in Houston. I think they're ranked one out of the 5000. They're ranked like 176 or something like that for 2022. It's just incredible, those type of things and the infrastructure and the team that they've built. Um, and I'm happy to be a part of it. But even in this market, right, I think I've done 19 syndications so far. Nine of them have been with Disrupt, 10, 10 of them outside of Disrupt and other ventures and partners that have done before them. Or maybe it's something that's too small because our buy box is about 30 to 70 million. But things that are smaller than that, that people bring to me as opportunities, I still take advantage and I play a role awesome. on those teams as well. You never but, say no to real estate, right? Yeah, I'm sorry? We never say no to real estate, right? I never say no to real estate. I say big or small, I'll take them all. I even buy some single family homes in the middle of, uh, of nowhere that get like crazy, like 20, 30% cash on cash returns, just because I, it's better than sitting in the bank, right? I can just go ahead and, okay. and um, get the asset that's spitting off cash flow. And for, for now, in this year, we've already closed on a 260 unit property in uh, Houston, which is where they're based. 
And right now, as of what, we're in August, we've got five properties that are under contract. And even with the heightened insurance environment in Houston and Florida, even with the higher interest rates that are happening because the Fed just raised the interest rate by 25 basis points a couple of weeks ago, despite all of these types of things, we're still able to identify opportunity and see where we can go ahead and make things work. And now we're actually assuming in-place debt on a lot of the deals that we're doing because who cares what the interest rate is today if I'm going to take over a loan that's already in place and just make up the difference of the down payment. Because the same thing would happen if you had to put a down payment to get a new loan or just pay off the difference from what the current owner is asking and what his current loan balance is. Say, hey, I like your loan. So we're working on a Texas three-pack right now. It's three properties, two in Houston, one in Austin, and it's 673 units. We're buying it for $111 million. It's my first nine-figure deal. And we're raising $57 million. We partnered with Open Door Capital on that one. Only $57 million to be able to get involved in this deal from private investors. And we've already raised just about all, I think we might have a million left, but probably not because it's been a little bit since I checked back, I got to look at the numbers again, but we're already done with that. And we still have another 260 unit in San Antonio and we have 105 units in Austin. You're moving, man. You're moving. I want to say something because I think I read it somewhere. Maybe you can uh, confirm that you guys have 98 retention of investors. As far as I know, my research that I did a few months ago, I looked up a couple of companies that I think yours was in there. 98 retention of returning passive investors. That's... Yeah. So the reason being is because, and this is, this actually goes back to why I really wanted to hitch my wagon to their horse is because when I got involved in multifamily, the one thing that none of the gurus or any of the coaches or mentors could teach me is how to underwrite a deal. Everybody's always trying to teach back of the napkin, underwriting things, which is okay to get an idea. But if you want to look in the nitty gritty of when you're buying and what you're going to get into, you have to understand the numbers on a very deep level. Luckily for me, I had worked as a senior financial analyst for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So it was a natural progression for me to be able to understand how the uh, return calculations are actually done in the financial models. And also when I got my degree in video game programming, I understand spreadsheets and formulas and all this stuff. So I was able to take the underwriting model and break it down cell by cell. Literally, it took me months to be able to do it, put it back together. And then I, was, I felt like Neo in the Matrix. And I was like... I understand the math behind commercial multifamily properties. I got involved and I was like, I want to be so conservative that I just can't lose. That's my philosophy on, on, in getting to these deals. With Disrupt, they are extremely conservative to the point where we only underwrite with very conservative metrics to a 15% IRR. In today's market, we're okay accepting maybe like 13.5% with about 7% cash on cash or maybe like 6.9 or whatever. Um, but we'll get it to like about 13 and a half percent IRR, 7% cash on cash. And if we can hit those metrics, we'll buy that deal. But the reality is from their track record, they've got a 50.6% average annual return on their investments. Wow. That's nuts. Right. Because yeah. under promise over deliver. Now, granted, a lot of the big increase that happened during the whole entire COVID timeframe when we offloaded a lot of properties, but it still stands that the number is the true number, right? Whatever happens in the future going forward or the next ones, we're now planning for longer term holds to be able to weather the upcoming, it's an impending recession that we're going to be facing right now. That's my opinion. I feel like as long as uh, it's already happened, the bullets already been fired off, right? The Fed's just jacking up interest rates. Banks are failing left and right. Oh, dude, I think it's happening since uh, April of last year. April 1st of last year, that's the that's when recession started. Everybody that read a book uh, about in, uh, inflation and a book about recession knows when two quarters are going negative, that's technically a recession. That's, but that's but recession. then they changed the definition of a recession. Well, who cares? Like I read those books 10 years ago. If they can change as much as they want, the reality yeah. is there. As soon as that happened, though, the, the prices, you can't, I, for three months, nothing happened. Because mm -hmm. the mainstream needs about, they have a lag about three months by the time they understand what really happened behind the numbers. Yeah. So they want to put my houses on the market. On June 10th, I had them closed and sold. And towards the end of the month, July, June, July, the end of the month, man, nothing was moving. Wow. Nothing yeah. was moving. Everything was stalled. So that was the real beginning of the recession. Whatever they're talking about now is just numbers. They're, they're trying to save it by, by uh, hijacking the interest rates. 
which yeah. I have a totally different opinion about that. I think they're just they're just working in the wrong direction, completely yes. undermining our efforts. And the real economy lies between four thousand syndicators. The real money, we're the producers of this economy. We're creating the jobs. We're creating everything. Mm -hmm. And what are they doing? They're trying to put total opposite of what we're doing. The effort goes in a totally different direction. I don't want to go into politics because it's not my thing. I want to dial it down a little bit. And why am I saying down and down? Because you throw so many things and knowledge and IR and returns and this and that. I understand them because I'm a syndicator. Most of the people that are watching us, they do not understand all of that. So oh, I want yeah. to dial down to just more common knowledge. If you're a regular Joe like me, I'm a construction worker, 100%. I identify myself as a construction worker. I got lucky to be interested in other things. Uh, because my daughter was born and I didn't have any money. I'm like, what am I going to do in this lifetime? For me, it was enough. But for me and somebody else was not enough. Mm -hmm. So that's how I decided and I got involved with real estate. And then seeing the models was a no brainer. I think anybody that starts making money with real estate is going to consider it a good investment. And everybody that loses money on their first deal, they're going to talk bad about it for the rest of their life, right? Yeah, my, my neighbor actually right next door, he's an insurance guy and he got into some real estate investments back in 06. Right before the big crash. The top, so, top, top market. Top yeah. of the market. Yeah. So he was like, for I feel like it's the same thing today. And and for people who are trying to get involved into multifamily, make sure you get involved with people who are actually doing deals that know what they're doing. As a matter of fact, uh, because I had so many people approach me, I ended up creating some documentation to help people get involved and learn multifamily for free. So if you follow me on Instagram, it's Rasul, R-A-S-O-L-C-R-E for commercial real estate. Uh, I'm the one with the blue checks because there's actually some scammers out there who are like copying my, my name and trying to sell my friends crypto stuff or whatever. It's the weirdest thing. But follow me on Instagram and shoot me a message. Just DM me the word guide. And I actually have a free multifamily investing blueprint that teaches you how to find deals, how to analyze deals, and how to build a team so you can start getting this stuff done. And if you want, reach out to me. I'm a very transparent, accessible guy. And I love having these conversations. I met Silvius at one of my networking events here in South Florida, and he showed up and got to talking and found out we had the connections because I know Alex Lovely of, of Legends as well. And we've partnered on a couple of things and we've recorded some uh, episodes as well, having discussions. I love where his mind at, his whole philosophy, his, his view of abundance on life. And I'm in total agreement. And that's why I, I was on one of his shows. I can't remember what he did. He did a really big virtual event over in Vegas. Oh, it was a summit. Yeah, he had a summit. Yeah. He had a summit. A, yeah, had a I, was one, I was one of the speakers there. Yeah. Ago. Yes, I remember that. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was one of the speakers on there. And it was a fantastic experience just to give people the knowledge that they need about multifamily investing. Because again, what I've done um, to be able to build a real estate portfolio of 3,311 units in the past three years is it's nutty. When I stop to think about it, I try not to stop and think about it. I'm just like, okay, where's the next deal? Where's the next deal? Where's the next deal? And I said, I'm going to give myself 10 years of just hustling nonstop. And I'm going to look back and then see what kind of imprint I've left on the world. And right now with the education, that was the e-commerce part of what I do. A lot of the digital teaching and the virtual events, uh, I host all kinds of stuff because I, I really truly believe that the world is changing from a nine to five economy to digital entrepreneurship being able to build businesses it could be a brick and mortar, it could be virtual, it could be anything. And with artificial intelligence and just the advancement of technology, there's a lot of new opportunities opening up and people need to, people are going to start waking up and figuring out that they can do more. And eventually real estate is, I think it's just going to be like foolproof unless we're all living in pods, like the actual matrix movie at some point in the future, and we're all living in our mind. I love that movie. I rewatched and I tell everybody, keep go watch it again because it's so true. It's so uh, relevant to our circumstances nowadays, yeah. especially with the artificial intelligence emerging. And uh, I don't even want to bring it out there, but I will. COVID and the whole spiel and the whole society and the wars and things that are going on around us. I think it's so relevant to see the big metrics and all social media and everything. You got to be out there, man. You got to be out there in order to be known. Cardone is right. He's a marketer. He sells the stuff because he's doing the work. He's in everybody's face. I think he's been in my face for over six years. And I've spammed these messages for so long up until I realized that I need that. So it's just an internal realization that everybody has to walk through and see it and witness it for themselves in order to start the journey going in that direction. Yeah.
I, I really understand that. And uh, just like Cardone, because you mentioned that, I start buying businesses. I recently purchased an electrical shop, a local business. That's how we met. And I want to bring it to all of you guys. Razul is real. I met the guy by chance by walking into a meetup. Like mm-hmm. we we were not connected before to any other syndication. Although we do, it sounds like we know some, some of the same people and we started at the same time. We met real in person at an event out of the blue. It was in Fort Lauderdale. And not once, but twice, and not even that, he's the one hosting it. So how real can it be? So if you have any kind of questions, if you want to see him, just reach out to him. And then after that, you're going to be able to actually see him in person if you're someone in the area. Yes, um, I want to ask you one thing. I, we talked about these, uh, for a beginner, we talked about Rod Khalif and his uh, event and uh, him being one of your mentors. And uh, he's one of my mentors. I took his courses. I did not join the warrior program that he has because I joined <laughs> Alex and his mastermind community right away. So I just can't put them all on top of each other. But there's so many tools out there. So what else would you recommend looking around you right now? Because when I got into this environment, it was extremely crowded. It wasn't just Cardone. It was Robert Martinez. It was Alex. It was Rod Khalif. It was like Jake and Gino. There were so many players. Michael Blank. Then I got into the CCIM Institute. Of, of, they have their own courses and classes. So yeah. all of a sudden, my, my brain was exploding. I'm like, where do I start, goddammit? It's too much <laughs> knowledge, right? Yeah. Where do you advise people to look? I know the guide that you have, right? Mm-hmm. You have a guide. That's the one. That's That would be, I, I would suggest everyone to just go in and pick up that guide. What was the word that they have to text you? It takes me the word guide. Or here's, here's my testament to the matrix. Like you're talking about, I, I love it so much. The name of my course is actually called the Commercial Multifamily Matrix. Because I believe that we're all born into the matrix. We're all programmed to be able to do things like cookie cutters. And the idea came to me when I was still working my nine to five as I was building up my real estate portfolio. Um, COVID happened. And then after COVID, we were working from home for a long time. They called us back to the office. I took paternity leave because I had my daughter. She was born. And I had a lot, bunch of time off. And then I had to go back into the office. I fought it for like two years. I go back into the office and it was the strangest thing, man. I literally felt like I was stepping right back into a program. I drove up to the, to the gate. The gate guard didn't skip a beat. I hadn't seen him in two years. Same guy. He was just there. Hey man, how was your weekend? And just, he, he sounded like a robot. Whoa. Yeah. And then I was like, good man. We, we chatted up, we laughed and everything. He's a cool guy. And I went, I parked, I went upstairs, sat in my cubicle, looked around, it was real quiet, dead. And I saw some people walk, talking by the water fountain. They're like, hey, man, did you catch the game last night? And I'm just like, this is so Same. weird. I, I go back, start doing some work on the computer. And then the cleaning lady, the janitor, she came, she walked through. I never have any trash. And it's it, my trash bag is right there. Like my trash can is right there on the floor, very visible. And she's basura, which is Spanish for trash. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, it's empty. And she's like, okay, thank you. And then she just walks away. She looks exactly the same, just a little bit more aged. Right. Because two years had passed and it was just like it was I swear, it was just I was like, I am in the matrix right now. These people have no idea that I've created a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio while I've been away from this office. And I got to get out of here because uh, something that somebody told me one time is like when you wake up out of the matrix, you have to it's inspiring. It's motivating. It's invigorating. You're like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that with my life. And you talk about some of the hardships that you face. I talk about some of the hardships that I faced along the way. And sometimes it gets discouraging, but you got to be careful because if you let the down things or the bad things that happen, discourage you from the ultimate goal of breaking free, right? And getting control of your life and living it the way that you want, you can actually get sucked back into the matrix and be like, oh, you know what? It wasn't that bad. And then the next thing you're back at your nine to five, you're grinding away. You're talking about the game that happened over the weekend. You're chatting up with the, the, I'm guilty the of doing that. staff. I did that twice. Yeah. And so you can fall back asleep. And then the, and the one thing that you realize, especially, and you can attest to this, you've gone back is I can't, you cannot unlearn what you've already learned. You've been exposed to the truth of what real life actually is outside of that nine to five. And, and God's placed that, that desire in your heart for whatever reason, for better or worse. You have that desire and it's going to tug at you for the rest of your life. And the last thing for me that I ever wanted was to wake up 75, 80 years old, 85 years old, God willing, and be like, I remember when I was in my 30s and I was like 50 years ago. And I was like, what if I try and applied myself and I learned what I needed to learn and I became a millionaire? 
it's too late now. I'm out of time. My candle's already burned out, right? There's, oh. there's nothing but wax all over the floor. I can't get back those 50 years that I lost. And, I, and that drives me. I'm like, I have to make it. Now. I'll plug in a book. I want to plug in a book. I agree with you a thousand percent. There's a yeah. book, The Five Regrets of the Dying. Mm. That the, book, the nurse in Australia? Same exact things. They're talking about what people said. I wish I would have taken more chances. Yeah. That's, I, I believe that's the number one regret. I wish I would have done more things. I would have taken more risk. I would have lived my life in my own terms. I wish I wouldn't care what other people said. Yeah. So, yeah. you I, And if I'm taking anything out of this conversation, trust me, I, I have lots of things to take away from it. Just I want to underline one thing. You cannot unknow what you learn and what you've seen. You yeah. cannot. And as soon as you realize that, that you cannot, if you know how to make money out of real estate, you cannot make money out of real estate ever again. Right. You just have to do it now. You have to put in the work to find a deal, to underwrite, to do all the work. Yeah. So that's what keeps me up and running and burning all the time. I cannot know what I already know. Yeah. I cannot, nobody can tell me that you don't make money in real estate when I know I made money in real estate. It's not going to happen ever again. This is going to be with me for life. And one more thing before I let you go, because I know time is it's very short here. I want to, in the next two minutes, I want you to recommend us a book that you've read that impressed you and it's still sitting on your desk or it's something that you have in, in your forefront. Yeah, two of the books. One of them you actually mentioned was The Miracle Morning Millionaire by Hal Elrod. That gave me the habit of waking up early. I still to this day wake up at 4.50 and go to the gym at 5 a.m. and just start my day off the right way. Get on my plane and gun, everything like that. But since we talked about that book already, the Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. I did right? not read that one. I'm going to take a note. Edge. So this book talks about the law of the slight edge, and it's always working either for your benefit or to your demise, depending on what actions you decide to take every single day. That's why every single day you have to make sure that you're moving the needle forward at least a little bit because that little bit compounds with consistency. Because if you go to the gym, think about this. If you go to the gym, and you work out eight hours, one day, just maximum intensity, you just go absolutely nuts. You're eating your meals at the gym. You're going back, working out something else. You just put maximum effort, and then you don't go anymore. You're not going to get any results from going to the gym. On the other hand, if you go to the gym for 30 minutes, and you give a good solid workout for 30 minutes, and you do that four or five times a week, and you do that for five years, right? It doesn't, matter. it doesn't matter how little of it that you're doing day to day. What happens, what matters is the consistency compounding on itself over time. And that's the premise of the slight edge. And, and, the, and the trick is being consistent and doing actions that are going to move the needle in the right direction. Hey, are you going to eat a burger every single day? Oh, it's just one burger. That one burger is not going to kill you. But a burger every day, multiple times a week. Yep. That's going to add up. The, the, the cholesterol is going to start accumulating in your arteries. And then all of a sudden, the slight edge is caught up to you because you're, that hamburger had compounded inside your body over 10, 15 years. And now you're going to have a heart attack. Same thing in real estate. Every single day, it's difficult to, to get out there, call brokers, look at deals, submit offers that don't get accepted because your offer is too low. And some screwball out there who's new to the industry is out there trying to buy a property overpriced when you mentioned grant cardone talking about the blood in the streets that's where it's coming from right multifamily has gotten a lot of attention over the last three to five years and people have gone into it and luckily for me it's just math right i understand the principles of mathematics to a very deep degree because i aced calculus in high school my degree is in video game programming which requires a lot of applied calculus physics and linear algebra Right. And then I worked as a senior financial analyst where I'm just analyzing millions of dollars of public housing authority funds and projecting over uh, the course of the next 30 years what that looks like for these guys. When I got into real estate, it was like, oh, this is, this is a cakewalk for myself. Finally. Right. Yeah. And so what I also learned about, which is really uh, dangerous in the industry, is that most people don't know how to run the numbers. Right. They don't know how to run the numbers. They don't. They don't know, I can't tell you. How many deals are in my inbox of people who are like, hey, Rasul, can you take a look at this deal for me? Like hundreds of deals for people who just want like a good second opinion because nobody really understands. I want to plug in something here real quick. No, I am not the numbers guy. 
as you are. I am doing my napkin underwriting. I'm doing a little bit of underwriting and I'm not focusing on the underwriting part of the game. Why? Sure. Because I associate myself with people like you. They yeah. are doing the numbers in a syndication. So I rely not 100%, but I rely on their knowledge and experience. They have the eight plus deals under their belt. Yeah. I am on my first one. So mm -hmm. as a newbie, as a beginner, at first, you won't be able to understand the numbers to that degree. My, my issues were like, why is the insurance this much? And how can we control the number in, in our projection for five years? Yeah. Like how, how can anybody tell me what the insurance is going to be in the next five years, right? So right. I was asking the questions from the scarcity mentality without having the knowledge of numbers because I never analyzed deals for the past 20 plus years. So right. in that regard, I rely on the syndicators that I associate myself with. And, and it's and, just and part of the game. Yeah, I can't do everything, but I, I took a real serious position. Mm -hmm. I am fundraising for the deals. I am the fundraising guy. That's the reason I'm going to all these events. That's why you see me everywhere in person. I'm yeah. everywhere because I talk about the deals that we have. I bring people to the syndications and I just present the opportunity to people that don't have a chance to see them. Do make sure, by the way, that your that your role on the team as a general partner is more than just a capital raise. I am one hundred percent. Yes, that's uh, okay. Exchange commission. That's good. Yes, I'm not the um, capital. I am. That's what I choose to do within the deal. I'm yeah. actually because of my construction experience. I'm actually managing the deal inside. Okay. All the rehabs and all the stuff. I do have active uh, deal into the syndication. Thank Fantastic. you so much for coming in, and I really appreciate your time, Azul. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. We did not quite get to the point where I, I have in this podcast when I'm talking about the relationship. And yeah. I know you probably went through the same roller coaster that I did, like most of the entrepreneurs go. And on the next future call, I would love to talk to you about how did you breach the gap of time between the syndication and the family. But I want to leave it for the next time, okay? For sure, I will do. And I actually have a really good story about that. So I can't to wait it. to find it, man. I can't wait to, to, to bring it up and uncover more of the data. Thank you so much for your time, Azul. I appreciate you. Hey, thank, thank you, you Sivis. I'll see you next time, my man. Yes, definitely. Thank you.